And from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. And uh, as from that reading, there's three themes I'd like to share with you today. I, I strongly suspect that I'm not going to get through the third, so maybe if... Um, if I do okay this morning, I'll be invited to share that. But we'll see how the time goes. So firstly, the multitudes came to Jesus to hear him. Sometimes we just pass over the word, don't we? We, we read it so quickly, but actually let's just pause about that point. The multitudes came to Jesus to hear him. And secondly, that the healing of Jesus followed and involved the hearing and the receiving of God's word. The healing of disease followed and involved the hearing and the receiving of God's word. And thirdly, from that text, healing power was released when they touched Jesus, the word made flesh. Okay, I'm not stretching it, they're just, just some basic observations and that was a burden of my heart this morning to share with you. So let's have a look at the first one. The multitudes came to Jesus to hear him. And we live in days when we are literally bombarded with words, you know, especially through the media, music, all sorts of things, and it's become normal. But I believe it's no coincidence as our enemy and the powers of darkness are terrified that God's people will hear the word of God accept it and live in the revelation of it. They're terrified of it. They haven't been able to stop us becoming Christians, so now they're actually trying to cripple us as Christians by blocking the reception of the Word of God and the Word becoming flesh through us. So they overload us with words, and our, you know it's become quite normal in our culture for the words of men to be multiplied. And don't you feel sometimes, I've just got to get away from the noise and I've just got to find a quiet space without all this, you know, and many of us don't realise how punch drunk with man's words we really are. Consequently, the word of God becomes relatively rare, as it was in the days of Samuel. God's word is drowned out by the noise of the lips of men. The word of God comes and goes unnoticed in the midst of that. It is diluted and polluted by the words of men. It is marginalised, it is neglected and tragically forgotten. Tragically, it falls to the ground in many places. And Luke records in his Gospel that they came to hear him. A great multitude of people from, it says, Judea, Jerusalem, from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, came to hear Jesus. They came to hear words from the lips of the prophet who many believe was the long-awaited Messiah. Some had travelled, it seems, for weeks. When you look at it on the map, how did they get there? How did they get from that? It seems as if when they heard about Jesus, they just stopped what they were doing, took their annual leave, or whatever, it, whatever they got in those days, they packed their bags, and they went to the place where the Word of God was spoken, where the Word of God was. And this was often noted by Luke. This isn't an isolated text. And in Luke 5, he wrote that as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, there we have it, they pressed around Jesus to hear the word of God. And at that time, he had to get into a boat because the press 
was so strong he couldn't physically actually cope with it and he, he needed to get off the dry land and he sat in a boat, sat down and began and continued to teach. And they pressed about him <coughs> to hear the word of God. And that word press speaks of urgency. It speaks of tempest. And Luke uses it later to describe the ferocity of a storm that drove that ship along in the book of Acts, which eventually broke into off offshore Malta. He uses the same word when they pressed around him to hear the word of God. And in Luke 5, um, it says, the report, this is 5, 5.15, the report went around him, around concerning Jesus all the more. And great multitudes gathered together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Notice the order that the word of God places it in. He, they came to hear him and to be healed. And, you know, not they came to be healed, but they came to hear him and to be healed. And in that, there's a lot of keys that I believe that the Lord wants to seed us with this morning. And it, for you, for some of you, I realize, you know, you may, this may be a reminder of things, you know, for others it might be new, but may the Lord open our hearts to receive. They came together to hear Jesus. They came together to be healed by Jesus. And even in Acts, you know, when the church began to expand and, and move across territory, it says that almost the whole city of Antioch, this is Acts 13, 44, came together to hear the word of God. Can you imagine that? Nearly the whole city was gathered together to hear the word of God. These scriptures, you know, they remind me of those words of um, Jesus when he spoke about John the Baptist. He said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. You think, what, what is that all about? It's a picture of a drowning man. It's a picture of a drowning man that has been thrown out a lifeline. And um, think of these words, in, in just in the, in the text that we've, we have read. Passion, violence, pressure, urgency, tempest, desperation hunger, thirst from ordinary people like you and me and who came to the realisation that the king had come and the kingdom of God was now available to them. They knew that they could hear the word of God from the very lips of Messiah and nothing was going to stop them. Can you get that impression? What sacrifice? What, what did they have to lay down in their lives to be there? listening to Jesus' word. How about us as Christians today? I'm very conscious. I'm going to ask some very um, challenging questions right now. And I know I'm the new kid on the block. And I, I like this place. Don't want to get kicked out. But I'm going to ask some challenging questions. What about us today? How do we compare with these people? Do we pursue the kingdom of God? and the word of God like this? Will we be satisfied with anything less than the very words of the living God? Will we settle for less? Are we happy with substitutes? Will we, um, or do we take action, we talked about this earlier, to separate and protect ourselves from the relentless flow of noisy words from the lips of men in order that we might better be able to hear the words of Jesus, the very word of God. Do we believe that we need every word that flows from the mouth of God to live as he intended? Jesus said that, didn't he? He says, you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Do we believe it? And if we believe it, what do we do about it? How do we live in the light of what he said? To what lens are we prepared to go to ensure we are positioned to receive the word of God? What lens are we willing to go? Are we passionate? Glorify are we desperate? Are we hungry? Are we thirsty? <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm sorry. That's okay, that was so much better. You know? <laughs> uh, so are we passionate? Are we desperate? Are we hungry? Are we thirsty? And as I said, I better stop there. There's plenty of questions to be getting on with. Um, but by contrast, you know, sometimes don't you read the Word of God and, and you think, wow, you know, Jesus was there, there was this crowd around him, and and everybody, the, the demonized, the oppressed, the, the afflicted in, in the body, were healed. And you think, why don't we see that today? What, what is going on? Why do we, why, what's, why the delta, the, you know, I talk about the delta, the gap between our experience and the Word of God? It used to trouble me greatly. I really stumbled in even being connected with the local church because I read the Word of God and was tremendously inspired. I went into the local church and I thought, whoa. What a delta. What a delta. How do I reconcile these things? But look at how that responds to the word of God. And I think it's a key. I think it's a key. So in our Luke 6 reading, we see, um, imagine what it must have been like. Often when we read the Beatitudes out of context, because he read it in the light of all these people who were seeing the power of God released, even as they just reached down and touched the hem of his garment, they were healed. What was going on? And into that space, he said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom. No, in, into that space, he lifted his eyes towards his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Poor, hungry, thirsty are those who are blessed. Isn't it a paradox? How? Why? Well, because they qualified. They met the criteria for being able to receive the good news of the gospel the good news of the kingdom or the reign of God, they qualified with the characteristics of poorness, of hunger, of thirst, of tearfulness. They recognised the delta. They, they'd been bombarded the words of men, the works of God were rare, and suddenly the word of God was there. And they hungered and they thirsted and they dropped everything to be connected to it and to receive it. Now I'm going to say something that will sound heretical. <laughs> okay. Have you noticed that the gospel is not for everyone all the time? Heresy? Yeah. Let's turn to um, Luke chapter 4 verse 18 where Jesus began his ministry and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor to the poor and there was a quite a conversation came up with one of Paul's um, four minute you know, morning reading the bed where one brother who's got, got a heart an evangelist he said oh, but you, just walk, you, you just walk away it's to the poor those who know the need and there's no point trying to actually speak to somebody about the gospel who doesn't even know they need saving who doesn't even know they need healing. And so what they need is the word of God still, but the Torah, the law of God. They need to understand the delta between where they are at and where God intended them to be. So this, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And then in Luke 7.22, if you remember, John the Baptist was in prison. And, um, and John sent some of his disciples to Jesus to say, are you the coming one, or shall we look for another? And Jesus, right then in front of them, started to work signs and wonders, healing those around them, and he turned to them and said, go and tell John the things you've seen and heard, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, Amen. the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Amen. The gospel is not for everyone all the time. And I put on the chat line, you know, to this brother, you know, one of the things I said was, 
He who wins souls is wise. We need to discern the season that that person is in and speak and respond accordingly. The gospel is for the poor. Now that word means beggarly. It means to be poverty stricken. It means to, to be powerless to enrich anything, either themselves or anybody else. Poverty, beggarly. And last week Paul said these words. The kingdom of God has spiritual laws that need to be applied. If we are going to enter into the revelation of the kingdom, offered to us from the lips of Jesus. See, laws that need to be applied. There are means of grace. I call them principles of the kingdom. Um, and um, you may have noticed I've already touched on some of these laws or principles. Firstly, the gospel is for the poor in spirit who know that they need <coughs> God's kingdom rule and they know that they need God's word to live mm. in health, in a place of health, of spirit, soul and body. It's a, it's a principle. It is just the way of God. It is his modus operandum. He's not shoving himself upon somebody who doesn't even know they have a need. He works in other ways to bring conviction first. And um, another principle is this. God sat fills and satisfies the hungry soul. And... Um, and but, but shockingly, he leaves the rich empty. He satisfies the hungry soul, but he leaves the rich. They come as they go. They go as they came. Whatever they had, they go away with the same. And um, and you know, Luke um, in in the Magnificat, where Mary or Miriam, as her name was, she declared, "He has filled the hungry." with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Did that shock you? Did it shock you? And then in Psalm 107 verse 9, he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry with goodness. Isn't this wonderful? I don't know about you, but I, I, you know, my prayer is that God would just generate within us such a hunger and a thirst for his word, and we will do whatever's needed to embrace it, not just to hear it, but actually to internalize it, to allow it to transform us, to allow us to come into that place where just a simple word of authority, or quite naturally, we are healed. And um, if you look at um, Jesus, is very strong on this, and again in the Sermon on the Mount, he goes on to say, Luke 6.24, but Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. You're not living in reality, guys. And he was saying, and you will suffer as a result. Come into reality and come to me with a hungry heart, with a thirsting soul, and I will meet with you, whatever your need is. Excuse me, just get a, a drink. I am nervous, you know. It's <laughs> giving me a thirst. You're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so one more question. How much time do we spend reading and meditating on the Holy Scriptures? Just how hungry are we for the Word of God? How determined are we to not settle with the word of man? However anointed, praise God for, you know, anointed ministry, praise God for wisdom that we hear, even in secular, from secular sources, but what we need most of all, the, the, one of the New Testament, the New Covenant promises is they shall all be taught by God. And even if an anointed minister reveals to you something very precious and you think, yes, that's right, Go away and ask the Father to speak it. Ask the Father to show you. So you receive it from him. When you receive it from him, you'll never forget it. 
you'll never forget it. There's a difference. We can get so <coughs> pumped up with anointed ministries and, and yet then we go back again. And we go back again and we go back again because it's never become part of us. But when God speaks it and we receive it, then it's different. Dear friends, let us come to Jesus to hear the word of God. And Hebrews 1 verse 1 says this, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in his last days spoken to us by his Son. By his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the ages. And you may remember that time on the Mount of Transfiguration, Remember that, I keep moving away from the mic, I don't know if it's uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration. We see this incredible vision, Jesus clothed you know, in light, and Moses talking with Moses and Elijah, and suddenly this cloud comes over, and out of the cloud, so that you can imagine just being in the cloud, can't see anything, this word comes out of the cloud, says, this is my beloved son, what did he say? <laughs> Hear him, listen to him. This is my beloved son. And then the cloud shifted and Jesus was there alone. Moses, this great man of God who spoke God to, um, with God face to face, was taken out. Elisha, this great prophet of old, was taken out. Jesus was left with the words ringing in the air, This is my beloved son. Hear him. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Now, you may have noticed that although Jesus healed, he was never called healer. He was never called the healer. He was always called teacher. He was always called teacher or rabbi, which is translated teacher. Isn't that interesting? He taught the word of God, and indeed he was and is the Word of God, who became flesh, and he made his dwelling among us. So, uh, we have considered that first principle. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, but the multitudes came to hear Jesus, who was speaking the Word of God as the Word of God. So let's consider the second theme. I said principle, I meant theme. The second theme is this, the healing of Jesus followed and involved the hearing and the receiving of the Word of God. I'll say it again, the healing of disease and the deliverance from the oppression of the enemy followed and involved the hearing and the receiving of the Word of God. Luke is really clear about this. He links healing with the hearing of God's word. Deliberately, again and again, he makes it clear. Let's not forget that Luke was a doctor and a healer of sorts. And Paul referred to him as Luke, the beloved physician. So here we have a doctor observing what's going on. He observed that there's the people came and they heard the word of God and responded in repentance, embraced it and said, whoa, I'm turning away from that stuff. They were healed. They were healed. I don't believe that Jesus ever, anyway, I won't go there because of time. I, I'm, I'm in danger of going off on all sorts of tracks on this, but I won't. I'll keep to my notes. So he recorded in Luke, that the people came to him to be healed of, his, of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were healed. As Jesus, he just says that very plainly, plainly, to hear him and be healed. What may seem surprising, and are you surprised when you read this text, how many people were sick? <laughs> how many were tormented with unclean spirits? But let's remember that those who came to Jesus at this location, on this day, were those who knew their need of him. So it's like this concentration of hungry people, concentration of broken people, all gathered in one place, 
and boy was there work to do and you know Sal and I have been involved with a ministry and we were involved in healing retreats and so on and sometimes I you know after the, after day one I go to sleep at the night and I think why there's so many broken people mm -hmm. but of course that's what it's for it's a healing retreat and people are coming because they're broken and that's what it was like here um, but also in this, the scripture reveals that the level of sickness among us is also much higher than we think. Whether of spirit, soul or body, we're not as well as we think we are. <laughs> because once we bring in the datum of what God intended for us, we realise there's a delta. But as I've grown more mature, <laughs> um, if I can say that for myself, with years, I'm nearly 60, I've been a Christian for how many years, 35, anyway, 32, I, I don't know, but over the years I've watched people, I've watched ministers, and often I see them effectively lowering the word of God to reach, to meet with their experience. They, they carry at it and they water it down to actually say almost like it doesn't really mean what it means because if it meant that then I'm not the perfect Christian I believe I am and I would be seeing all these things happen but what does God want us to do? He wants to raise our experience to the word of God and he's willing to do that if we are willing to go with him and to walk with him. So. When the words of God are rare in society, now this is a very brief and compact paragraph, the reason for sickness among us is very profound, and please don't, so don't, this is a brief uh, little heart dump, yeah? So, but this is what I wrote. When the words of God are rare in society, and the words of godless men are multiplied, people drift from the truth of who they are, and how they should live. And complexity becomes normal. Confusion and darkness prevail. And they get involved in all sorts of idolatry and things that gradually but surely bring sickness and oppression. And we could say much, much more, but that was just a succinct paragraph. We're sick because of... Oh, there's a reason. And you saw them when he came out of Egypt. He said, I will inflict none of the diseases that were upon the Egyptians. Those people walked without sickness in that huge community. Even their sandals didn't wear out. Mm -hmm. Whoa, what, what, is going, what is going on? What is this? What is this reign of God about? Are we hungry? Are we thirsty? You see the need of our community? Are we going to play around with the word of God or are we going to take it seriously? Are we going to really receive it and be able to minister it powerfully in the community that is so desperate for the truth of God? So, but Luke notes that same godly order when in Luke 9.11 he records how Jesus welcomed the multitudes And he spoke to them about the kingdom of God and how he healed those who had need of healing. Look at these three. He welcomed them. He taught them. He healed them. So simple, you know. Sorry, cut. There are exceptions, of course, to, you know, when we talk about godly order, there are some, tragically, who would seek healing from God, who have no particular interest in bringing their lives into alignment with the Word of God. They just want to be healed and get on with their lives. They fail to understand that their emotional, physical and spiritual health is restored as and when the Word of God is embraced and lived. Mm -hmm. 
And as they turn away in repentance on what they've been doing in the past and turn into the light, restoration begins. Sanctification, washing begins. Restoration, back to what God intended. But the normal way, oh yeah, no, I wanted to say that there are exceptions, of course, amazing signs that sometimes God gives us in certain miraculous and dramatic healings. They do happen, don't they? And often to people who think, well, they've never heard the word of God or whatever, they haven't met all the criteria, but God moves to get people's attention. And we see that, and we, you know, like the, the man at the temple called, um, at the gate of the temple called Beautiful, when uh, they looked upon him and they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, rise up and walk. And then what happened? They came running into the temple, dancing, and then this whole opportunity came forth, you know. So God does move that way. And then our gifts of healing, of course, where the disciples of Jesus, you know, prayed for others to be healed, and often they are, sometimes they're not for a whole complexity of reasons. But the normal way, the normal way, brothers and sisters, for people to be healed, for you to be healed, is to hear the word of God. Take personal responsibility to turn away from the stuff that was wrong, that is wrong, which brought the sickness, which made you vulnerable, which compromised you, and your health will be restored. Sometimes it's dramatic, sometimes over years and months and sometimes the anointed word of authority is involved sometimes it happens without anybody else involved you know that you've been walking the path of repentance you're still under bondage and somebody with a, with a sense of discernment says in jesus name go the garbage has been removed all that's needed is a word of authority and um, and in other places it just happens restoration and healing just takes place because, a bit like rats, you know, you've got rats in the garden, take away the stuff they're feeding on, the rats will go. And a lot of us enter into healing unknowingly, and sometimes it's very dramatic. But healing shall surely come as they obey the gospel of the kingdom and the teaching of the king. Okay, well on the home run now, as I say, I won't get to that third, that third point, maybe another time. But um, Psalm 107, verse 17, if, you've never, if you haven't read it, or if you haven't read it in a long time, read Psalm 117. And, uh, but verse 17 says this, Fools, because of their transgression, and because of their iniquities, they were afflicted. This is talking about oppression, this is talking about sickness, this is talking about loss of health and well-being in lots of ways. And it says, their soul abhorred all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Jesus said, for this reason I was sent. God sent the word of God into this world to bring healing and restoration to broken, fallen humanity. Again, going back to what Luke said, the people came to hear him be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were healed. But let's note something important. It's not just the hearing of the word of God but the doing of the word. It is the integration of God's word into our lives that brings restoration. <coughs> and I, I'm not sure if it's completely theologically correct, but for me, it's when the word of God becomes flesh in us. And one of the greatest dangers we face as Christians today is to hear God's word. We hear it, but we don't do it. We become forgetful hearers. And when we do this, it's a stark word. James says it, not me. He says, we deceive ourselves. When we listen to the word of God and don't go away and do it, we deceive ourselves because we think we know the word of God. We don't know it. <laughs> it becomes, you know, it becomes real when we do it. We are fools trying to build our houses on sand. Do you remember Jesus spoke about that? The wise man and the foolish man. I want to say this, whenever we resist 
the will of God, as revealed in the word of God, we self-harm. <laughs> Whenever we resist the will of God, as revealed in the word of God, we do ourselves harm. Jesus said, I remember that time when that people came to him and said, my you know, your mother and your brothers are outside wanting to talk with you. And he turned to those around him, seated around him. He said, my mother, my brothers, are those who hear the word of God and do it. And again in Luke 28, blessed, he says, are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So we just considered that second theme, that the healing of disease followed and involved the hearing of God's word. And as I say, that third theme, that the healing power was released when they touched Jesus, the word made flesh. We'll have to wait another time if you invite me back. Okay, should we just, um, let's just pray. such cause such thirst yeah. cause such hunger in us for your holy unchanging word we would come to Jesus to hear